This good? Cool. Hello, everyone. My name is Francis Wirtz, for those that do not know me. Um, anybody here working in .NET? Two? OK, three, four? We got, what's this mean? Kind of? Kind of working .NET? OK, OK, you've, you've, been, you've been introduced reluctant to say that you're working on it. Anybody here that is working in .NET, even if this or this, uh, use Blazor? I've dabbled. Dabbled? OK. How long have you been using? Yeah? OK, cool. Well, this will probably seem like you're just at home then. Uh, I work for a company called Holman based out of Jersey. We're a large enterprise, um, a lot of .NET, a lot of old .NET. Um, and now we're starting to branch into Blazor over the past couple of years. So I did a talk at CPOSC two years ago, no, last year, 2023, um, as more of an introduction to Blazor. I stole some, some content from that just to give an overview because there wasn't a whole lot of hands that went up uh, during that talk. So I was assuming probably not a lot at this one either. So but very specifically, we'll be looking at what's called the interop. Um, but this will just be a cursory. This is kind of a very small topic within the scope of .NET's current web architecture and Blazor itself. So um, not a whole lot of content to go over, but I'll provide some examples about what this is going to help me do um, within my organization. Uh, so what are we going to get into? Um, just going to read off the slides because I'm not too good at rolling off the cuffs here. So brief history of Blazor. Uh, we'll, we'll go over that. We'll talk about the two primary hosting models kind of a third hosting model now with .NET 8. Um, we'll get into its competitive WebAssembly version, um, sort of a version, I guess. Uh, and then we'll talk about the JS interop, which does apply to both. But specifically, we'll be looking at it with, uh, with the WebAssembly version. And then we'll see how we can actually plug Blazor components um, into existing JS-based apps. So it could be anything. It could be a uh, Vue app, React app. I got a little sample React app here that we'll, we'll look at how we can integrate with that using Blazor. All right, so what is a Blazor? Uh, not the vehicle, but it is browser plus Razor with an L in the middle. Uh, I'm assuming without the L, it probably would have got confused with the uh, unsavory other brand. So uh, yeah, a Blazor is uh, two typical uh, Razor pages um, with, some, with some magic sprinkled on top. Uh, .NET Framework runs in client server um, and as well as a progressive single app applications uh, and as well, also mobile and hybrid. Haven't done much with uh, Maui and the mobile hybrid just yet, but I've used the server architecture as well as WASM quite a bit now. Um, it's got the core building blocks of any other, you know, full stack web application system framework. HTML, your different CSS languages, um, Razor, WebAssembly, SignalR, which is Microsoft's um, framework around WebSockets, and then of course ASP.NET Core. First launched, I believe, .NET 5. I was trying to do the, go back the years because it's typically released every year. I don't know what happened around 2020 because we're just getting version 9 this year. So I think 2019 was version 5. Uh, apologize for the formatting. I copied this from, a, from another slide. Uh, so developed by Steve Sanderson and team at Microsoft. Uh, 2017, it was demonstrated during the Microsoft MVP Summit, uh, their annual conference. And he demonstrated the kind of the preview release candidate version of what um, Blazor and Blazor Wasm could be from Microsoft. Um, throughout 2018, they added on major features, experimental releases up to version 1.0. Um, and then in 2019, uh, at the end of 2019, they did their first major release. So why Blazor? Um, well, for those with .NET experience, um, very easy to pick up and learn, especially if you've used Razor. It's basically Razor, not a whole lot different. Um, very easy to adopt for front-end focused users. Anyone here work in React, Vue, primarily on the front end? Yeah, a lot, a lot of us work on that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of very similar concepts. This is a way for, uh, we've, we have a lot of React focused developers that can be very productive in some of our Blazor systems because they're used to component-based uh, Vue architecture. So if you're working in stuff like React, Angular, Vue, Blazor is not too much of a departure. Um, powerful web tooling uh, ships natively with a lot of stuff you would get in a pretty similar kind of environment for, say, like React, maybe with some additional um, uh, things that you would install. But you get routing out of the box, forms, validation, all that, direct injection, um, hot reload, which was 
sketchy up until like .NET 8, so, but it works pretty well now. Um, layouts, server-side rendering, static rendering, um, tag helpers, all that lovely stuff. Um, and yeah, you can, you can build and deploy on pretty much any platform. So um, haven't had too much of an issue running .NET on the Mac, on the Windows machine. It's been fairly easy. We have one team is starting to work on some desktop apps for it. We have a Flutter for our mobile system today. So they're very into like hybrid systems for uh, mobile, and they are exploring Blazor hybrid as well. So that could be a, kind of our first candidate for any kind of new applications that we're building uh, in the coming years. So Blazor server, this is focused on WASM, but I won't talk about server. Um, the, the first hosting model uh, is Blazor server, built around SignalR to facilitate real-time comms between the client and the server. So everything is sent over, all user model interaction, all data, everything rendered is facilitated uh, over this SignalR stream. Um, it sets up, uh, when you first connect, it establishes something called a circuit. And that circuit is what's used to basically manage the life cycle and the state of that relationship between the browser and the server. Um, so you can kind of think of the browser as like a very kind of almost like thin client. There's not a whole lot going on. It has a JS runtime, um, establishes a connection, and then is just interpreting the DOM and the user model back to the server for processing. Uh, WASM, a bit different. Um, so this is more of the single page app. Uh, writes the exact same. Uh, not a whole lot of adjustments you have to make to your application specific it's itself, mostly just in like the program CS, you've got to change around a couple of different services that, that you would use. So it's nice, they're relatively portable in terms of switching one to the other. Um, so this install, this will basically build out a static set of bundles, um, supports a ahead of time compilation so that you can kind of skip shipping the whole runtime and you can just get native binaries. Uh, again, speaking of sketchy, just like hot reload, very sketchy, again, up until .NET 8. Pretty, pretty decent now. So trade-offs are longer build times, maybe slightly larger uh, payload downloads, but it's an upfront cost and not too bad. So hosting Blazor, WASM, ideal for standalone apps. You wanted them to be progressive apps, offline. Um, very simple to host, right? Just static hosting for those files and very portable. Um, server, great for real-time processing, um, allows you to keep basically everything on the server, fast pre-render times, uh, very simple to do data integrations with server. All right, so I'll take a break there. Any questions on the hosting models? No? Okay, good. There is another host, was that a question? You mentioned ASP quite a few times in your slides. Is it limited to ASP or does it also work with C Sharp? Uh, how do you mean? Like, can you use C Sharp with all of this instead of ASP? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. Um, there is now kind of a, not really a third hosting model, but um, in .NET 8, and it's getting a lot of support in the upcoming release of .NET 9 here in November, is I think they were calling it Blazor Hybrid for a while, it's, or, or Blazor United. It's basically just, they're unifying it to Blazor. So there's no longer needs to be a separate hosting model. Uh, you'd basically develop one Blazor application, and they've actually kind of pushed the responsibility and the behavior down to the component level. So you can tell the component how you want it to render. So obviously even static apps, you know, if, if you don't want to host them as a standalone, you want them to be server hosted, those components can phone back home easily over that same constant uh, network, and then they can render like the initial data download, and then from there it's all can be handled on the browser. So there's kind of a cool set of functionality. I'm not gonna show it today, but Maybe in a future talk, I'll kind of show how you can dynamically switch between uh, different, different render modes, all within the same solution. Uh, but any of that uh, would not be possible without the interop. So each of those two hosting models has their own flavor of the Blazor JavaScript runtime. And each of those are really uh, powered by this JavaScript interop. Um, so it's available with each hosting model. Uh, provides a, pro a programmatic way uh, to invoke JavaScript from, let's say, C Sharp or vice versa. Um, data types, pretty much anything you can serialize with JSON, you can send over this set of tools. Um, and it also supports unencoded byte data and streaming data as well. Um, limitations more focused around 
the server. So you can, it, this is probably more useful in a server setting. But again, what I'm going to show you is for WASM. But um, in a server model, right, you can, instead of like having APIs you got to send data back to, you could sim simply use the interop to invoke uh, your, your component logic back on the server and pass data uh, over, this, over that same um, WebSocket connection. So, the, you know, obviously with circuit instability, if you disconnect from your server and have some, some poor connection, you know, handling, you know, that could possibly be an issue using the interop. Doesn't work well or at all really with circular data references in, uh, in your data. And the data size maximums are a little bit limited. Um, I don't know what they are exactly, but it's, that's more focused on the signal our data limitations per packet. Now let's look at some examples. So I'm a bit new to this kind of topic, maybe you could tell. Um, I've been using Blazor and Blazor Server for a while now, but more recently uh, at my company, we've kind of hit this critical point where for the past five years, we've been getting out of web forms, MVC, and getting more into React focused types of applications. We've got some view stuff sprinkled in there, but every team is probably 20, 25 different IT groups, dev engineering groups that are all working more or less independently. We've got a lot of we've got data overlap, uh, but our UIs are starting to drift apart in terms of implementation. So now we're trying to bring it back. How do we lean into standardization and bring everything back home? And so more recently, a lot of those teams have been leaning into Blazor um, and using that as a tool to provide value uh, to our to our customers and internal tools, what have you. Uh, but our backends are all still very much tied together. Here's one of our stored. Here's one of our um, one of our packages. So we're very much a stored procedure-based company. That's a twenty, almost twenty-five thousand line stored, stored uh, set of stored procedures for our dashboards. Uh, over here to the left is about I don't know two hundred to three hundred more files that look exactly like that. Uh, an absolute nightmare for for building applications that are very data focused. A lot of tabular data. A lot of very you know, um, involved, customizable pieces that are all styled differently, maintained by different teams. Not a whole lot of overlap in terms of how they're constructed and maintained. Um, and here's just one example of one of our dashboards. These are all independently rendered and, and pull from that very large package. So anytime you want to build something new, you know, you've got to have the expertise to go in, create all the, the, the Oracle package code. Like there's no real, not an opportunity to share a lot of the experience in UI. Everything's replaced, not dry at all, not even by <laughs> the furthest stretch. So we see this opportunity now where this is, this is a page built in Blazor, um, where we can leverage what we've developed in Blazor so far and then bring that into other areas we've already built in the past in React, allowing our React teams to stay productive, but also allow our Blazor developers to um, be able to reach in and support their, their different systems. So as we standardize our design language, our widgets, our components, all that kind of stuff, this interop might give us a lot of power and ability to say, hey, rather than you write your thing, I write my thing, right? Rather than try to make your inner work in web forms and make this look like mine or mine like yours, let's harmonize on how we can do this once and inject that into different areas. So. So I want to go over here. I set up a simple, very, very simple um, solution here with a couple of projects in it. Um, so this is a .NET solution uh, with a Blazor WASM project in here. There's a core project. This has some simple domain stuff in it, not much. Uh, a basic API, just because I'm calling out to Twitter. You'll see that here in a minute. Um, and then a, just a, basically just a simple create React app scaffold. Uh, for a React application. So if I let me get out of this here. That's pretty well visible. I wish you guys were as excited as the crowd. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can I, yeah, woo! <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, all right. So um, I'll just kind of walk you through real quick uh, the the architecture. So again, core, just simple. Is this, is this readable for everybody? Can I see this? All right, you don't really need to see it too well. I'll, Share the code if anybody requests. Some simple stuff, just a simple model. I got some stuff in here that I'm using to connect out to Twitter or X. I guess we're calling it X now. I'm going to keep calling it Twitter. If that offends you, I don't care. Uh, API, this uh, just essentially is just doing the call out to 
Twitter for me, because this is a WASM application. So any data I want to get external, uh, I would need to make have some sort of API to make those calls. Um, I could call directly, but I figured I'd, I'd, I'd add that in there. Uh, and then the WASM product itself. If you're not familiar with how a WASM product is structured, um, it's really kind of up to you. The standards are basically you'd have a components folder, which is anything that's shared or reusable. Uh, a layouts folder, which you guessed it, just supports your layouts. So if you've got a larger application, maybe with different areas, different concerns, um, you have different, different layouts there. Um, everything else, pages, those are kind of the, the most top level components. These are all the same. So these are all just, these are all just Razor components. Um, not a whole lot different between each of these. Uh, we'll walk through some of the components here in just a minute. Um, you have your primary app, right, just like your app JS, and then you have your program CS, which is scaffolding this all together. Now, some extra stuff that we have here. Um, I have an example JS interop, which is basically, uh, it's not an interop itself, it's just using the interop, just a little bit of like syntax sugar on top of it. Um, and yeah, I think that's about it for what's unique in this. So, I'll kind of talk through uh, what we have registered in order to make this work. Before I do that, I'll just speak to what I have running. So right now, again, a WASM project you would build. This is running in a dev container that I've basically constrained to have virtually no resources. So to do an AOT build on this would take like 15 minutes. Again, just because it's a very small dev container running this. But your outputs are going to look similar to this. If I go into release where I've published this, it's going to ship with a WW root and a web config. And the WW root contains you know, content, framework, your styles, any, any app, app settings you want to ship, and then your index HTML. That's your, that's your footprint. Now, your footprint gets a lot more scary when you open up framework and you get through all the different uh, pieces that have been gzipped. This is that large initial download size uh, that, I was, that I was talking about. So not all of these resources are pulled in all at once. A lot of them are pulled in dynamically with any modern, decent web access, this takes maybe two to three seconds on initial download. And then from there, you wouldn't even, wouldn't even notice a difference from other, other applications. Um, so I have this currently just running using the WebAssembly dev server. Um, so that's actually going to be what's, what's um, serving up all of the components over to the uh, React application, though I could just copy in all that static content should I, should I need to. Then I have my API running, and then lastly I have the React application just running uh, with npm run dev or npm start. Um, okay, so the program CS. This is in the Blazor Wasm application. Um, first things first, I'm establishing my host host builder. Again, not super relevant if you're just going to be building this out um, just as a static application. Um, and then there's this additional piece. This is actually an extension into the Blazor ecosystem. This is what's called the, I think, it's, I don't know, it's custom elements or custom components. So this is a bit of a dated implementation. There's a few different ways to do it. I've included the, there's resources at the, at the end of this talk um, that go into a couple different ways that you can render components, either using plain JS calls or you can use this, which actually converts your Blazor uh, components into the web component specification. And so with that comes some limitations. You'll see here I have like these like my dash counter, my dash prompt. Right, you're kind of limited in like the, the different naming conventions, but for all you know, purposes here and what my use case will be, um, this is just fine. I don't, not a whole lot of data I need to in inherit from a React application. I'm looking to just drop in my component, have it spool up, maybe pull like a session piece using JavaScript or pass it in as a prop from React and let this thing just run. Um, supports, these all, this all supports just standard, um, anything that you can serialize with JSON, you can use as a, as a property on any of these components. So I've got four here that I'll, that I'll kind of show you quickly. Um, I'm adding a couple services, so I've got my JS interop, so I can inject that. And then I also have my word provider, which I'm using for this last word cloud component here. Beyond that, just registering a call, uh, registering an HTTP client that I can then inject as well for my different components. Uh, the components themselves, we'll kind of go through uh, one by one. So 
get out of the API. Let's first take a look at the let me get there components counter component. Very very simple. Uh, has an H1 tag, a P tag that shows you the uh, current count, and then a button. You click the button, it increments. That's it. Um, really, really valuable for us uh, at Holman to have counters that people can click on because then they can focus on clicking on that and not how slow our apps are. So let's drop that into uh, our application here. So React application, I've just got the four components added here. In order to scaffold this, uh, there's really not much needed. So I drop in this, which won't do anything uh, by itself. Uh, in this case, because I'm calling over to the WASM dev server, I do have a proxy set up here just so I can call over, I can proxy over some calls to Content Framework or Blazor. You would need something like this if you were going to render your components and serve them with Blazor server. It's, you can do it either, uh, either way. Um, so this is kind of emulating what you would do with Blazor server. Um, what else? I believe the last couple pieces are, I copied over some scripts. So again, you could serve these uh, over, your, if you have a Blazor server connection, you could serve them over as content. I just chose to include them in the React project by themselves. And then just a couple includes. So I have another script I didn't feel like put into its own file. I just left that there. Um, I have a dependency to build the word cloud. And then the primary piece is importing the, J, the JavaScript runtime for WebAssembly. So that is blazor.webassembly.js. So relatively lean in terms of what it would take to get Blazor components to render inside of React. I think I saved my app.js. I did, so I've got my counter running. And as you'll see, it automatically re-rendered for me. So here's my counter, right? Got the header, this, and I can sit here and click it. There's absolutely nothing happening uh, between me and the server right now. So the user interaction is totally served through WebAssembly running on the browser. Let's take it up a slight notch. So not really much going on with the interop there at all. However, the my prompt is doing a little bit with the interop. Let's take a look at that component. All right, so this one, I'm injecting my example JS interop. We'll look at that in a moment. Uh, again, header tag. Uh, I've got an input where I uh, am accepting a message from the user, and then I'm binding that to a variable on the component. Um, and then I have an event, show prompt. If I click that, it's going to do some stuff. We're going to reset a reply message, and then we're going to issue a prompt call uh, on the browser. Um, and then we're going to use the interop to actually pull back the, the reply. So I mentioned the interop allows you to invoke JS from C sharp and vice versa. You can do that, you can straight invoke .NET C sharp from the browser itself, pass along data, or you can actually just pull back a response as well uh, by doing the, doing the invoke from the C sharp side. So I'll show you here in the interop file. I'm calling, I believe I'm calling prompt. So um, this is actually going to do two things. It's going to dynamically import the JavaScript. So I didn't mention this, but in addition to invoking, you can dynamically import scripts uh, as well. So that's the first thing that's going to happen. I have this kind of pre, pre set up when it's registered. Uh, it'll have a task out there to, imp to, to pull this in. Uh, we'll await that. And then once we have that module loaded, these are just JavaScript modules, then we'll invoke the show prompt. Sorry, the show prompt message. So let's go back. We got my prompt loaded. And just as we expected, we got our prompt component. Hello, TL for Tech Lancaster. We'll hit show prompt. So we see there the prompt.interrupt.js got loaded in. And then we're met with a hello TL. The reason we see that is in our prompt, I didn't cover this, but in our scripts here, our prompt interrupt is doing this using the well-loved prompt JavaScript call, taking in the message that I passed over from C Sharp, and then I don't have a default re reply set, but I could just say, yo, that concert sounds crazy. And hit OK, and then I'm passing that back to my component running C Sharp, which is then going to render that reply out for me. So that's a very basic example of how you can pass data to and from. Uh, let's do something a little more advanced, a little more cool. Uh, before we do that, any questions on this so far? 
you know, very captivated audience. Um, yeah, like I said, it's very, kind of a very small sliver of what Blazor can do, but uh, the building blocks here and the impact, I think, are going to have a very nice, uh, very nice uh, offering for my, for my company, what we're trying to do. Uh, so next one is my video. Uh, so this one here, a little more involved on the interop. Uh, basically, I guess kind of more or less the same thing. Uh, the component is going to invoke this video call. Uh, this has some callbacks, though, to my .NET code. So this component, again, of course, header, uh, a button to start capture, and then I actually have a video tag here, which we'll see how this works in just one moment. Um, and then I'm gonna, when you click that, you, call, you click the button, you get start capture, which is going to invoke this video. I don't think my IntelliSense is working. Oh, it is working, great. Uh, okay, so this is going to pull in a separate script, which I'll show here in a second. Um, it's gonna invoke open camera, and then it's going to pass in, should record. I think I have this hard-coded to true. I hope I do, so we can see how it calls back. Um, let's see what that code looks like. Here's the video interop. So here, this is going to attempt to get my webcam. Show us do it. Start capture. You'll see it loads the video interrupt.js. I'm going to allow it. And then, oh, shoot, there I am. Look at that. I'm on my own presentation. Whoa, wild stuff. Um, and then we'll see here, I'm outputting the bytes. As I'm reading, as this is happening right now, the bytes are actually being sent back to the server. Right now, I don't, because this is a Blazor WebAssembly, I can't like write to a file or anything like that. I could through the interrupt, but I'm not going to send data to and from. Just to, just to write the file. But if this were Blazor server, I could then take this and write it to a file. You know, you could use this with any kind of media, video, phone, how, however you wanted to use this kind of tech. So what this is doing is if I'm recording, which I set this to record, um, establish a couple of JavaScript objects here. As data becomes available, there's probably a better way to do this. This is what ChatGPT gave me. Uh, I'm calling .NET invoke method async. And so what this is doing is I'm giving it the uh, giving it the namespace, a method that I've declared is invocable by JavaScript, and then I'm just simply passing it the byte array to be processed. And if I go to that in the JS interop, I believe it has to be a static method, and I believe you cannot have naming convention collisions, which is why you give it the namespace and the method. So this is registered as a static method on this namespace to be invocable by JavaScript. And so this is, all this is doing is just receiving the bytes and then, again, through the interop, any console write lines that I do in Blazor Wasm automatically get written back to the console that you see here. So that's a kind of a to and from. And then lastly, um, I was hoping to like do something cool like embed this into the CPOSC website, but uh, just kind of ran out of time, and it's way easier to set up this for uh, React than what it is for Vue or Vite. Is that what it is? Vite? Is that what the things? Vue? Vite? 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 Yes. Okay. Well, I, that's not v I'm not Vite when it comes to, uh, to modifying Vue to use Vite to render Blazor components. I can tell you that much. Um, but it's just, it's just an example of something you could do. So. In the talk I did, uh, and I did cover some of this uh, in the talk I did last year, I set up like a chat using Blazor Server to do like a real-time chat. Uh, so I figured that might be something cool to eventually drop into the CPOSC site as an example. But one thing I did put together was a simple word cloud. Um, again, I think more of the magic here is just, uh, is just JavaScript. But this kind of speaks to, if I've got a, like a lot of complexity that I'm doing, like maybe I want to do a word cloud from my own company intranet. I want to pull all of our blog posts and come up with like a sentiment on discussion around a, a, a certain thing and then drop that into, you know, a simple web page that we set up to show it like a corporate offsite. You know, I could build that out in Blazor and then just drop that into an existing website that maybe a third, a third party had built. So I got a word cloud here. This will hopefully successfully call out to uh, Twitter or the X APIs. Uh, and I'm going to search for .NET Conf. And then, oh, look at that. Lo and behold, I got my little word cloud there. Uh, it's very expensive, the new X APIs. So this is only searching recent tweets and not historical tweets. So we get a lot of different kind of fun. I didn't do a lot of time ignoring stop words like this and ellipses. but. 
yeah, and again, this is just doing, this is using the interop, so the component itself is very lean. Um, let me go to that. That's that here, word cloud. Not a whole lot going on, um, except the search term, the width, the height. Uh, internally, I'm injecting the word provider. I have this type set up called word frequency, as we saw that earlier in the domain project. And then, as I said, I'm using the provider to get the word frequencies and then calling the generate word cloud. That's taking the data, doing a little massaging, and then this is just using the JS runtime straight up. So I'm, I'm not uh, injecting any kind of like example in, uh, interop on top of it. I just get a reference to this JS runtime, which I believe, yeah, it's injected up here. So this is kind of the most raw form of using the JavaScript um, interop. So I'm just calling that directly, just invoking this generate word cloud, passing along my array of words. Um, and that is calling that script I had established here, which is using that uh, word cloud to JS to establish that word cloud. That's again, it's not bidirectional, it's just, it's just one way. But in this example, I can take a set of complex data, rather than build all this stuff or, you know, pull in React, I might already have the technology that I have already built in Blazor, very simple. Uh, to incorporate that into an existing JavaScript app or embed it where Blazor really has no business running. So, uh, let's jump back to my presentation. All right, recap. So, Blazor, a couple different hosting models, technically three with this new kind of Blazor web. Um, where it's all running under one kind of solution, one, one, one kind of framework, and you can control the, you can control the render mode. The, the JS interrupt is, is like instrumental in all of that. Um, offers the ability for you to translate user interactions to the DOM uh, and, vice, and, and vice versa. Um, developers can custom de define how the de their components will initialize and leverage the web component standard. Oops, skipped. Uh, leverage those different standards to make it interop interoperable with different JS frameworks. Uh, here's some resources. And uh, any questions? Just one, though. Is that the rule? You only, you only get one question? I think that's the rule. <laughs> What's your one question? <laughs> Two as one. I don't, I don't know. Yep. But I tried to. Yeah. Um, so at one time, Apple did not support JavaScript on iPhones. And I don't know if that's still true or not. So my question is, if that's true, how does what you do to handle uh, stuff that's an iPhone if you're online, if you're running the application on the phone itself? Okay, so the question is, based on the possibility of a uh, area where you might want to render Blazor components if they don't support JavaScript, does this solve that? It does not, no. This needs JavaScript to function. Blazor in general needs JavaScript to function. There's that JavaScript runtime, so regardless if it's uh, WASM, which is WebAssembly, yeah, it would still require JavaScript. Now, I might be a little bit wrong on the WASM side. I'd have to actually look. I haven't seen any kind of like way to run Blazor WebAssembly like, without JavaScript, but WebAssembly itself is an entirely different, you know, that that could be used to potentially run this. And, and there's actually something I talked about in my talk in C++ last year uh, called WASI, which is almost like a containerized system runtime that's all built upon WebAssembly, uh, where you can actually run a lot of this stuff inside of. But in terms of like how you present that to the user, um, yeah, that might, that's would require JavaScript as far as my understanding goes. Yep. Yes. Apple's, Apple's browser, but you wouldn't use these to build like a quote unquote native app like you would Yeah, I need to brush oh, okay. up. So okay. No, well so there is Blazor Hybrid and I need to brush up on that on that tooling. I'm not too familiar with it, but you would use that to build a native application through this right. Blazor hybrid tools. Be, be quote native, right? Yeah. The specific native to that right. you would only be allowed to build it using Swift or JC. Right. But like there are Native is like a JavaScript runtime that eventually uh, 
I don't know how they do it, but they, it compiles down to either they're using like a web frame, they're using like Safari, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. It's a web frame web running on top of data. Yeah, like we use Flutter, and so that would be like a shell application that they, it kind of constructs and then injects everything kind of into it. Yep. What else we got? That was good. That was good. That's a good question. You talk yeah. about one of the, the big upfront costs is like the extra download size. Is there anything, any tooling with uh, with like the and that is that you know similar to some of the other like for end builds or like Webpack or Beaver, do like yeah. Yes, um, that's funny that you mentioned that. So I just, I've been, a, I'm a little late, and I'm way ahead of the curve on like the next version of .NET. I just watched kind of what's new in Blazor for .NET 9. Typically on the, uh, on the odd releases, there's not quite as much that they offer in terms of like features. So this one's been a focus on performance uh, and code splitting and also loading optimization has been a big thing that they are coming out in this, this particular launch. So last launch was like the AOT, like do a lot of that stuff so you don't have to ship. Like the big cost I believe was like the runtime yeah, yeah. in WebAssembly and JavaScript. You have all that in order to interpret everything. Uh, it's much leaner now. Um, and so AOT is available today. This, that, that build I showed a little, little while ago was AOT. It drastically increases build time. Again, for dev machines, like this, this one could zip through it just on native hardware, but over the container it's a little slow. Um, but yeah, I think the only really caveat with this, uh, in, uh, interpret and execute time on the browser is very fast. It's just the initial download is what's, is, is what's actually slow. So yeah, there's a lot of optimizations coming for that. What else? Yes, sir. Just curious, what was your use case or design decision of exploring Blazor when it sounds like you're really just using the JavaScript in a portion of it versus just using, like, if you're in React anyway, why not just use React script? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, why bother? <laughs> no, no. Um, so initially, like we were leaning into Blazor uh, just because it, you know it's the next Microsoft framework. Now, up until like last year, my former boss was convinced it was like the next Silverlight, and it's just going to be like Silverlight. I think we've hit a critical point where that's not the case, but hopefully, um, Silverlight had a much longer run than Blazor so far. So hopefully, that's not the case. But uh, initially, it was just I think just a simplified tooling with all the with all the benefits that you would get from a component-based framework like having React or Vue as your primary view. So um, yeah, I, I think it was just that it ships with all of the things that you would want it to ship with. You wouldn't have developers using, oh, well, I use React, ho React hook forms and whatever the other ones are for like processing how I validate my forms. And oh, I use moment, I use date functions. Like it doesn't, like this just ships with all the standard kit that you would need to do most of the basic apps that we're actually gonna be building. So I think that was kind of the big selling point. Uh, all of our stuff is largely server rendered, so we could still achieve that with also having a component-based architecture. Now specifically with this, with yeah, you still gotta use JavaScript. Absolutely, we're not really shying away from JavaScript. We're just trying to find a way how we unify these. So with Blazor, like, we don't have to go build all of our, we don't have to like create all of our backends in C-sharp.net and then switch over, build them all again in, in TypeScript, JavaScript, whatever, do all the translations. We can leverage all of that code uh, all under the same solution project. And then the idea is that we just get portability, but you'd be able to bring Blazor into different areas where we already have React. Stuff that, it's not really trying to replace what we have in React. We wanna keep those teams productive, keep them using the tools that they're comfortable with. But if there's an opportunity to bring in like a really complex data grid, rather than license two different Telerik solutions to build complex data grids, we can just use the one we've already licensed uh, on the Blazor side and bring that in, rather than have to build it all again. We wanna add features like you know, sorting, filtering, custom column selection. We don't have to do that twice, three times across the entire org. We can do it once, and make, that more, make that more portable. Yeah, yeah, VS Code, uh, Microsoft recently, all the uh, open source plugins for like parsing and working with C Sharp used to work great. They came out with their own called C Sharp Dev Kit, nightmare. Um, but hopefully it'll go the same way that uh, the hot reload did and the, and that, the other one I forget, and it'll be 
drastically improved. It's a lot better already. The debugging tools are a lot better. But yeah, I agree. That's all valid, but for some reason, it's flipping out. Love it. <laughs> you just get used to it. Yeah, you just get used to it. If the build works, it works. What else we got? That's it. Cool. Thanks, Francis. Thank you. Thank you.